Hi, I'm Joel Thomas. You may remember me from such grammar presentations as Your Friend, the Colon, and Commas, Commas Everywhere. Welcome to yet another Writing One presentation. Sentence figures from outer space. To follow along with this presentation, you'll want to have your pocket style manual open. I'll make references of a couple places, and uh, those will be posted in the slides as well that you can look and this presentation is talking about the various building blocks for sentences and some pieces of sentences that do sometimes cause confusion. So let's start off by talking about phrases and clauses and sometimes these can trip students up so make sure you are following along. There is a main difference between a phrase and a clause and that is a phrase does not include both subject and verb. So it's a series of words. A phrase is just a few words that fit together, but they do not include both a subject and a verb. Whereas a clause, C-L-A-U-S-E, a clause does include a subject and a verb. So a clause will be a group of words that has one subject, one verb, maybe even more. But that's the definition of a clause. It has to have a subject and a verb in order to be a clause. Again, a phrase is a group of words, and a subject might be there, a verb might be there, but they're not there together. As a result, a phrase cannot stand alone as a sentence because it doesn't have a subject and verb. And as you probably know, a complete sentence has to have a subject and a verb, even if that subject is what we would call the understood you. If you're not sure what I mean by that, don't worry about it for right now. But a phrase will have several words pieced together, but it will not have the essential components of a sentence, a subject and a verb. Clause, on the other hand, does have a uh, subject, does have a verb, and so it could stand alone as a sentence. Now, not all of them will. We'll talk about that shortly. But a clause could possibly often does stand alone as a sentence, um, as a complete thought. But again, not always. As you can see here, we have two types of clauses. So we just learned that phrases have either a subject or a verb, but not both. And clauses have a subject and a verb. So theoretically, a clause could be a sentence. So let's look at the different types of clauses. We have the independent clause and the dependent clause. And just like the words would indicate, an independent clause can act on its own, just like an independent person could act on his or her own whereas a dependent wouldn't be quite so much that way. So an independent clause and a dependent clause both include a subject and a verb. Remember, that's what defines a clause. But when we look down here, we can see the actual difference. And that is, is that an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence. It's a complete thought. And you can see a definition of that on 378 in the Hacker book, the writer's reference. A dependent clause, on the other hand, does not stand alone as a sentence. And usually the way you can tell is if you look at the first words, do they include a subordinating clause or a verbal phrase that you thought was acting as a verb? So if you think that you have a complete sentence and I say, no, 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 that's not a complete sentence, and you thought it was, usually it's one of these two things is the case. You either have a subordinating clause or what's called a verbal phrase that you, you thought was acting as a verb. Now, you probably are thinking, I have no idea what those things are. Well, stay tuned. We'll talk about them next. Let's talk about subordinate clauses first, and we can see the hacker definition. A subordinate clause is patterned like a sentence, with both a subject and a verb, but it begins with a word that marks it as subordinate, or as it says here, a word that tells readers it cannot stand alone. It's a, a subordinate clause is a group of words that is a clause, but it functions not as a sentence itself. It functions as an adjective, an adverb, or a noun. So it functions to describe something else in the sentence, or it functions as a noun, whether that's a subject or an object. It can really act either way. So that's what it does. Now, when we use the term subordinate, you may have heard that term before. Sometimes you'll hear that in the workplace or the military, that someone who is a subordinate, that means that you, if you are the subordinate, that means that you are underneath someone else in rank or someone else is your boss. So in the army, the general would have many subordinates, including captains and sergeants and even down to the private first class folks. Um, in a workplace, again, your boss 
has subordinates, including you. So that's what we mean that way. When we talk about it in a sentence, though, what it means is that a subordinate means that it is less important part of the sentence. Again, you know, everyone's important in the workplace and in the military, of course, but we would say that someone by rank is a little bit more important. So the subordinate means that we have a part of the sentence that's a little less important than the independent clause part of the sentence, um, which could be its own sentence, um, a complete sentence on its own. And often we'll see that. We'll see two clauses in a sentence, and one of them holds the main meaning, the primary meaning, the stronger meaning, and the other part just adds some description to that or acts in the place of a noun for part of that larger clause. So let's look at some examples next. As we get into some examples, first let's look at some words that include or that introduce these different types of clauses. And like we said before, if you're wondering if you have a dependent or independent clause, look at the first word in there. And oftentimes, if it's a subordinate clause, that first word will give it away that it is subordinate clause, therefore it is dependent. It can't act as its own sentence. So we have a whole list here that you can look through. Again, you may want to pause the presentation and read through those and look through those. Um, as I'm talking here, I'm sure you've had a chance to skim. And remember that these different clauses act as different parts of the sentence. They might act as an adverb or an adjective, so they're describing something else in the, the larger sentence, or they could be acting as a noun. So again, here's a nice list of words you can see. All right, let's take a look at an example of how it actually looks in a sentence. And, and there are two examples here, and it's basically the same sentence, but showing the different places that a subordinate clause would usually be. So the first one, Buster hid under the bed because he wanted to avoid a bath. And I've underlined the subordinate clause part of it. And you can see the first part of it, Buster is a noun, hid is the verb. And then we have a nice prepositional phrase saying where he hid. And then we have our subordinating clause. Our subordinate clause is because he wanted to avoid a bath. And you see that word because, that should trigger because you just saw on the previous page that word because is in there. And so you should see, okay, that's probably the beginning of a subordinate clause. And we see the subject he, and the verb wanted. And then we see actually a verbal phrase after that, to avoid a bath. We'll talk about that here coming up very soon. And we see that in this case, we have that whole phrase, because he wanted to avoid a bath. Well, that describes why Buster hid. So it describes really hid. So it's acting there as an adverb because it's describing the verb. So we see that here. And again, what sometimes happens is students will cut off that sentence. They'll say, Buster hid under the bed. And then they'll stop. And then they'll say, because he wanted to avoid a bath. Well, no, they're all one sentence. Just keep the sentence going. Um, because you're specifically describing the verb in the previous sentence and you don't want to cut that off. Likewise, then we see our second example here. Because he wanted to avoid a bath, comma, and you always want that comma after the subordinate clause when it comes first, when the subordinate clause comes first. And so we say, because he wanted to avoid a bath, well, again, same deal. We see it has a subject verb. It's the same phrase we just looked at. We've just put it to the front. And again here, we've said, why did Buster hide under the bed? Well, because he wanted to avoid a bath. So again, it's describing why he hid. So describing the verb. So that's an example of a subordinate clause example and how we would look at that in the sentence. And we talked earlier about how with the subordinate clause, the, the main meaning is in the independent clause part of the sentence. So the independent clause here would be Buster hid under the bed. Because you can see that works on its own. If I just said Buster hid under the bed, you'd have this idea of a dog hiding under the bed and you wouldn't know why and it may not matter to you why. But if I say because he wanted to avoid a bath, that word because triggers something in our heads and we say he did what? Because he wanted to avoid a bath, what? He ran away? He you know, dove into the mud even deeper. He bit me on the hand. Why? What did he do? Okay, so that cannot stand alone by itself. So on the other hand, again, Buster hit under the bed can work on its own. It's an independent clause. 
and it works out pretty well. So when we combine them, the lesser meaning is because he wanted to avoid a bath, and it goes well with that independent clause. Hopefully this makes sense, and you'll be able to use this more effectively in your own papers as well.